Good afternoon, everyone. I am Mahmoud Abunaga, Solutions Fellow here at the Center for Climate and Air Solutions. And I want to thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on scaling carbon dioxide removal. Before we dive in, a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel within 24 hours. There will be opportunities to ask questions throughout the webinar. We have almost 700 people registered for the webinar. Uh, so we will do our best to get through your questions. Please use the question tab in your control panel to send your questions to our speakers during the discussion. The format for today's webinar uh, will be a short presentation on how CDR is projected to play a role in the different mitigation pathways. It will be followed by our first panel discussion on the potential role for nature-based and technological CDR solutions in future decarbonization strategies and how corporates design their carbon removal programs. After that, we will have another short presentation on how the Earth system responds, responds to net negative CO2 emissions. And it will, also, uh, it will also be followed by our second panel discussion on public perception of CDR and the environmental justice as part of the CDR agenda. Uh, for those who are not familiar with our organization, C2ES is an independent nonprofit nonpartisan organization that brings together diverse interests to find effective and innovative solutions for climate and energy challenges. Uh, we work with local and global policymakers, business leaders, and other stakeholders to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, promote clean energy, and strengthen climate resilience of local communities. Uh, the innovative solutions part of our work brings us to today's webinar. As many of you may know, uh, the, a great number of recent studies, including the recent assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, have underscored the urgency to expand the use of carbon sinks to avoid the most drastic consequences of climate change. The IPCC uh, report highlighted that CDR solutions will be necessary to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement and limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. However, uh, the current pace of development of CDR solution is still lagging behind uh, these efforts in order to meet such goals. We recently uh, published a closer look paper on pathways for CDR that I will advise you to check on your own time. And we will add the link here also in the chat box. And as we mentioned in that paper, while we recognize the potential and the importance of CDR, it cannot be emphasized enough that CDR solutions is not a substitute for cutting emissions. The availability of CDR solutions shouldn't justify any ongoing decarbonization efforts, which remain our top priority. With that, let me introduce our first speaker for the day, Dr. Yuri Rigel, who will start, who will share with us um, some insights from the IPCC report on how CDR is projected to play a role in the different mitigation pathways. Dr. Yuri is the Director of Research at the Grantham Institute at the Imperial College London. He is the lead author for the IPCC six assessment report. And he's also a long served leading author on the annual emissions gap report uh, by the in United Nations Environment Program. With that, over to you, Dr. Yuri. Thank you very much. And just waiting for my slides to come up. There we are. And I think we can immediately switch to the next slide. Uh, in these opening remarks, I, I would start with this update uh, from the last IPCC uh, six assessment report of one of the iconic figures of the IPCC, which shows on the horizontal axis cumulative emissions of CO2 and on the vertical axis uh, global temperature. And it shows that every ton of CO2 that we add to the atmosphere adds to global warming. And this is also kind of the, the scientific evidence that underpins our understanding that um, to halt warming, to any level, uh, global emissions need to be brought down to net zero and the total amount of carbon dioxide that we can ever emit needs to be kept to within a carbon budget. So this is really the basis of any, uh, any mitigation pathway and also thus of our considerations of how to use CDR. Next slide, please. Translating this to the Paris Dam, Paris Agreement, then uh, there are um, 
two key goals of the Paris Agreement. Uh, in Article 2, of course, the climate goal to keep warming well below 2 degrees and uh, pursuing efforts to limit temperature increase to 1.5. But, uh, but an additional goal in Article 4 states that uh, countries should uh, peak their emissions as soon as possible, undertake rapid reductions thereafter, in order to achieve a balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources and removals by sinks. Um, in other words, uh, globally, we would need to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Now, putting these two pieces of information together, we can start uh, to scope what that means for uh, scenarios. Uh, next slide, please. Because we have a carbon budget and because we want to limit or the, the Paris Agreement mandates us that we need to limit peak warming to well below two degrees and preferably 1.5, any transformation pathway consistent with the Paris Agreement uh, consists of a transformation towards net zero and a transition to net zero where the total amount of carbon dioxide that we emit until then defines our peak warming and then a long-term state, a long-term state where we either keep emissions at net zero or we uh, reach net negative emissions uh, in, a, in an effort to slowly reverse the warming from the peak level that we have achieved earlier. And um, this figure shows net emissions, but, uh, but uh, the scenario literature also informs us that um, actual emission strategies are a combination of emission reductions and removal. If you go to the next slide, you can see how um, for a typical pathway that limits warming to 1.5, this is one of the pathways of the illustrative pathways of the 1.5 degree special report. You can see in dark uh, or in, in lighter orange, how gross emissions are reduced and at the same time, uh, removals are scaled up uh, from today onwards and reaching uh, much larger uh, amounts in the second half of the century. If we advance one more slide, um, you can see here in the, in the dashed black line, that is, that is the uh, trajectory of net uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, however, as we saw earlier, the Paris Agreement does not mandate uh, that we need to reach net zero CO2 emissions, but that we need to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions. If we add these additional greenhouse gases on top, such as methane, uh, the other greenhouse gases such as methane or nitrous oxide, and we add them on top uh, in the manner that is currently um, also mandated under the Paris Agreement by using the uh, global warming potential over 100 years metric, um, we see that also to reach net zero greenhouse gases, we would require an even larger amount of carbon dioxide removal. Now, uh, if, we, if we advance yet one more slide, what do these targets bring for the climate? Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the same graph as I showed before. On the right-hand side, you can see the temperature outcome. At the time that we reach net zero, uh, global warming will be broadly stabilized. Because of the way in which net zero greenhouse gas emissions are defined, uh, the blue arrows on the right, um, reaching net zero greenhouse gases actually achieves more than just stabilizing global warming. It actually achieves that global warming is peaked and sl it's slowly reversed uh, or gradually reversed over time uh, as we keep that state of net zero greenhouse gas emissions. If we would reduce emissions even further, then that reversal um, will be even further accelerated. Um, the carbon now, until now, we I have only described carbon dioxide removal as a kind of a amorphous, uh, amorphous uh, contribution without much uh, detail. So, if we move one more slide, then. We have, um, this is one visual from the IPCC special report on global warming uh, of 1.5 degrees of global warming. 
and um, it shows basically the contributions of um, in, in a typical 1.5 degree pathway or a stringent mitigation pathway of the reductions in fossil fuel and industry emissions, um, the switch from uh, agriculture, forestry and other land use emissions from currently a source to a sink and then additional and additional contributions from technological CO2 removals, be it uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage or direct air caption, capture and, uh, and, and storage. Uh, why are these distinctions important? Um, in, uh, because different options and different contributions come with different consequences. And if we go to the next slide, there you can see an overview uh, that was published in the last uh, IPCC report that was published just over a month ago that made an inventory of um, several of the different carbon dioxide removal methods, uh, made a rough assessment of its uh, biogeophysical and technical sequestration potential, which, which are the blue arrows. But then all the colors on the right, all the different indicators there show different side effects and different feedbacks that can be the result of the deployment of a certain carbon dioxide removal measure. And these carbon dioxide removal measures uh, include land-based measures such as uh, soil carbon sequestration or afforestation or reforestation, but equally ocean-based me measures or technological measures such as bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And the, the presence and uh, the knowledge about these potential side effects or co-benefits um, is really important and is an important part of uh, developing and designing low emission, uh, low emission pathways. On the next slide, I show four different pathways, uh, again, from the IPCC 1.5 degree special report that all reach net zero CO2 emissions somewhere around mid-century. Uh, but do so in very different ways. Again, you can see the different contributions. Uh, the gray is fossil fuel and industry, and the yellow are the technological contributions. The, the title here says it all. Not all, all pathways are created equal, and they require strategic choices. For example, the, the top left pathway requires deep reductions in energy demand and um, and a, and a strong focus on sustainability, whereas the, the pathway totally on the bottom right uh, sees still, still higher levels of energy demand and lower levels of uh, contributions of nature-based solutions. And that brings me to the conclusions on, the, on, on my last slide. Net zero is a key feature of any pathway that holds warming uh, and particularly as part of the Paris Agreement. CO2 removal in pathways is used for two important reasons. First and foremost, it is used to reach net zero and to be able to halt or to cap warming. Um, but second, it's also uh, used to go beyond, uh, to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions as mandated under the Paris Agreement, and even to uh, potentially accelerate the reversal of warming in uh, the long term. Strategic choices about the nature and the scale of CO2 removal are essential and necessary. And then finally, I think we all need to understand if we look around us and we look at the impacts that we are experiencing today, um, net zero or achieving net zero CO2 emissions is only the beginning of the journey that we are currently starting. And we, we, we have to plan to, to, re to first and foremost reach net zero, but then also go beyond that and slowly start reversing the impacts and the uh, disturbance that we are currently causing with our activities. And with that, I hope, uh, I, I wish you all a really nice session and I look forward to the discussion uh, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Yuri, for your presentation. Um, you gave us like a, a clear idea uh, on how the scientific community views carbon removal as a potential and maybe a critical tool for uh, climate mitigation. Probably that needs more focus from our side. Uh, I think your presentation sets the stage very well for our next panel discussion, where we will discuss the different 
pathways that you mentioned that are not created equal, which are like the nature based and the technological uh, pathway, as well as how corporates approach their uh, carbon removal programs. Let me introduce our uh, panelists. Peter Ellis. Peter is the global director for Cl of climate science at the Nature Conservancy, where he leads the global climate science team to conduct research that informs the design and implementation of nature-based solutions. Lori Gutt, she's the vice president and head of business development at Carbon Engineering, where she leads the commercialization of the direct air capture and air to fuel solutions. And Elizabeth Wellman, she's the carbon program director at Microsoft. She leads Microsoft carbon program, including fulfillment of the company's commitment to be carbon negative by 2030. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And let me start with you, Peter. Can you briefly tell us about the removal potential of nature-based solutions and what is needed to integrate them into CDR strategies? Thanks very much, Mahmoud. It's an honor to be here. Um, as uh, Mahmoud said, I'm privileged to work at the Nature Conservancy where I lead a team of around 12 scientists that investigate um, and inform the deployment of what we call natural climate solutions. Those are um, nature-based solutions focused specifically on mitigation um, or NCS. So thanks very much to Dr. Jory. We now really understand how important it is um, that we need to find some form of technology that can help us out of this predicament we put ourselves in, facing the greatest challenge civilization's ever faced. And we need that technology to be able to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it sustainably. Um, and, and we need investments in technological carbon capture and storage now. But unfortunately right now, even the most advanced forms like the Climeworks facility um, in Iceland are operating at prices of about 600 to 800 tons per hectare. And so I find it interesting that um, as a biologist, that there also is this other form of technology that you're looking at on the screen. It's um, been around for a very long time, it's been around for 3.5 billion years. Um, and it's been in a very, um, in a very dramatic and successful research and development program over that time through what we call evolution. About half a billion years ago, a really successful prototype was developed out of that research and development program that got out of the wet lab in the oceans and started spreading across into the terrestrial biosphere and now covers about a third of the surface of the earth. Actively in living tissues stores about three trillion tons of carbon dioxide today, and historically has stored another five trillion tons more or less in long-term fossil storage, what we call fossil fuel reserves. And we need to obviously cut our emissions of those. So this technology is obviously photosynthesis and the prototype is plants and trees. So all that Natural Climate Solutions says is, let's work with that technology that exists as cohabitants of spaceship Earth to effectively face the challenge of climate change together. Next slide, please. So about five years ago, uh, we set out to answer this question, how much really can Natural Climate Solutions contribute to this fight? Um, next slide. And we came up with the following answer, which is 11. Um, and actually it remains around that number. Uh, we like to say that we need to turn our amplifiers up to 11, nature is amplifier, um, if you catch the reference. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but happy to talk more if anyone has questions about it um, and the research that's ongoing here. Next slide. The point I wanna make is that, oh, sorry, go back. There should be an animation in the last slide. If not, that's fine. There we go, perfect, thank you. About a third of the 11 gigatons, a little bit more, comes from removals-based natural climate solutions or NCS. So restoration activities and improved management activities that sequester more carbon in natural ecosystems. And those are really important and from um, Dr. Jory, we learned 
that we need them in every pathway. But it's also important to look at the way Dr. Dory showed that we phase that work over time. Most all of those graphs showed use of the natural and technological and removals coming towards the end of the period. And it just so happens as an ecologist and conservationist who thinks about how we phase interactions on the ground and interventions on the ground to effectively um, deliver not just the climate mitigation we need, but also all of the other important co-benefits that you saw highlighted in one of Dr. Dory's slides there. We need to make sure we phase them in the right way so that they don't undermine each other. So we have some research coming out in the next month or so in the journal Nature Climate Change that promotes something we call the NCS hierarchy that says we need to progress through protection, management, and restoration activities in order so that we don't undermine ourselves. In other words, investing now in removals, NCS actions without sufficiently investing in protection and improved management actions is a bit like trying to heal a wound before we've stopped the bleeding. Um, so thank you very much. I've talked too long. I'm really excited for some rich discussion and honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for this overview of the potential of nature-based solutions. Let me now move to the technological side of the conversation and ask you, Lurie, carbon engineering has been capturing carbon over like since 2015, if I'm correct. Um, what have it changed over the last few years and how do you see that play a role in the big picture to net zero or even to net negative? Thanks, Mahmoud, and thanks to CTUES for hosting such an important discussion and to the audience for your time and interest in scaling carbon dioxide removal solutions. As you already mentioned, uh, direct air capture is a technological solution to carbon dioxide removal. And you can think of DAC as like a great big vacuum cleaner, vacuuming CO2 molecules out of the air. And it sounds like a little bit of magic, but it's not. Um, it's some pretty simple chemistry and it's how we put people in spacecraft and submarines for decades. We know how to grab those CO2 molecules out of the air. What we didn't know when carbon engineering was founded back in 2009 was how to do that at very large scale and at very low cost. And carbon engineering was founded um, almost as a backup plan. We were still talking about um, trying to reduce our emissions fast enough so that we didn't need to remove gigatons of CO2 from the air. But uh, fast forward to 2018, the IPCC um, said, you know, it's time we need to start thinking about how to, in addition to reducing emissions everywhere we can, which is of course what we need to do first, we need to think about how to remove carbon dioxide from the air. So carbon engineering was founded to, to, um, to figure out, can, is it possible to remove uh, CO2 from the air at large scale and low cost? And for us, a, a, the target size of project has always been, how do we get to a one megaton project? So that's removing a million tons of CO2 from the air and at low cost at $100 a ton. And at the time in 2009, it was sort of between $600 and $1,000 a ton to remove CO2 from the air. So it was too expensive. Um, in fact, getting to net zero today costs about 8% uh, of global GDP if, if we go with the Goldman Sachs data, and that's just unaffordable. We need to bring DAC to bear on that problem and reduce the cost. In fact, when you bring DAC to bear on the problem, we bring um, getting to net zero down to about 4% of GDP, which is still an enormous sum of money, but DAC actually makes it affordable. We implemented that technology in 2015 and started capturing carbon with, the, with the, tech, the technology. And we published our technology in 2018 and we're the only company to have done that. We felt it was important for the world to see that it was gonna be possible to get to that large scale and low cost. And so we published a detailed techno-economic report showing how uh, we were gonna be able to do that. And then in 2019, we had an alignment of stars. So what happened is our technology was ready to go to scale and we had the first regulated market um, California led the way to say that um, under the low carbon fuel standard that had previously been focused on solutions that would avoid a ton of new fossil emissions entering our atmosphere, now that it was possible to take a ton of CO2 out of the atmosphere and permanently remove it through geologic sequestration, California amended their low carbon fuel standard to allow for direct air capture and sequestra sequestration projects to earn an LCFS credit. So that happened in February of 2019. In May of 2019, we announced that we were moving forward with the front end engineering and design of our first project, um, first, uh, uh, first full scale project, the one megaton scale project that's in behind me in cooperation with our partner in the US 1.5. Um, so we began the front end engineering and design of that project. It, it breaks around next year. 
Um, and that will be a building block then. Climate scientists say that we might need to get to 10 to 20 gigatons of permanent removal by the time we get to 2050. And so our job as a technology company is to make sure we bring that tool to the climate toolbox so that we have that technology that does a really good job of scrubbing CO2 molecules out of the air so that we can either put them to work uh, low carbon fuels or permanently remove them back safely into the geosphere um, as we've also been doing for decades. So we're really excited. We're also really excited in addition to regulated markets starting to um, enable director capture like the Washington LCFS that was recently passed, uh, the voluntary market um, starting to lean in and companies and, and individuals leaning in and saying we want to help motivate these solutions to happen faster. So we will build out this clean technology as fast as markets pull um, and we're excited for the future ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I will come back to the issue of the durability and permanence of, of removal. Uh, but now that we have heard from both experts around nature-based and technological, let me turn it to you, Liz. And let's, can you share with us like some insights from Microsoft experience with developing a cardboard removal program and how, it's, how is it challenging at the corporate level to have such a program? Absolutely, thank you, Mahmoud, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. We um, at Microsoft set a commitment to be carbon negative back in January, 2020, based on our observations uh, from uh, being grounded in climate science that the natural world has been out of balance for quite a while. And we've seen that increasingly uh, this year after a year of climate impacts, forest fires that have ravaged the West Coast of the United States, as well as flooding in uh, many parts of the world. And we're moving into COP26, a pivotal moment for this topic to be sure, with a deeper commitment than ever. And we approach this through our carbon removal program in three different, three different ways, um, three M's we like to call it, meaning, um, which is really how do we define carbon negative? What do we mean by net zero? Um, we really ground um, ourselves in uh, the atmospheric ledger, not just our corporate ledger. Um, simply, simply put, we need to be guided by the laws of physics. And that's why we set a carbon negative commitment to um, first and foremost, reduce more than half of our value chain emissions remove the rest, and then remove the equivalent of our historical emissions. So that's crucial to us. And the, the meaning of not only carbon negative, but also net zero um, is just crucially important to get right. And the second, um, the second M we like to talk about is measurement. And that's um, critically important. Um, at the highest level, it's critically important to have clear carbon accounting for carbon removal as distinct from avoided emissions. We very much believe it's crucial to avoid emissions, of course, but um, we've realized, as many, um, many have realized, especially those on the call, that we need to, we as a global economy, need to stand up um, a multi, multi gigaton market for carbon removal as soon as possible. We can't delay. Um, the development timelines for these plants are just, um, and for these projects, are so um, uh, long that we need to start now if we have any chance of having a robust market by the year 2030. And um, to, uh, that brings me to the final M of our, <laughs> of our alliteration uh, journey here, which is markets. And so Microsoft has started um, with an RFP, a request for proposals that we issued last year, which we think was the first of its kind. And um, we issued contracts, which frankly are the widgets of um, the widgets of the economy, of widgets of the, the any market, um, but really establish and codify the agreements that buyers and sellers and um, stakeholders have around what what has meaning and what should be um, what should be uh, measured and and uh, used as the basis for standards. And so through that request for proposals, we learned a ton. We were among the ones to do, um, among the, the earliest to do this homework. And so we felt it was um, our obligation to share those lessons learned. And so we published our lessons learned um, as unvarnished as possible in a white paper that we issued last January. Um, and we've also learned a ton since then in, in, the, in the intervening months. And we actually published a series of criteria that we use to vet and validate the projects that we consider. And we published those criteria in July. Um, most recently, um, in, the, in the way of uh, helping to develop markets, we also um, just on Monday uh, announced that we have funded um, $100 million to the Catalyst Program of Breakthrough Energy. And um, that's a program that invests in um, 
climate solutions that are needed to achieve net zero. Those include direct air capture, sustainable aviation fuel, green hydrogen, and long duration energy storage. And we're really excited about that, uh, about that initiative. So um, all told, we think that it's crucial to get these three pillars right in order to have a healthy, um, a healthy chance at, at meeting, um, meeting our not only our removal goals, but our net zero goals. And with the clock ticking, as climate scientists have told us, and, um, and those we'll hear on the, later on the line um, will continue to tell us, we just don't have any time to delay. We're working on overtime here. So um, we really appreciate the opportunity to participate in discussions like this and look forward to more dialogue on this important topic. Thank you. Uh, we are working on overtime. Uh, I will I will take that quote to to label our discussion because that's that's very accurate. And as we receive questions from our audience, so we have a question here for uh, Peter. Um, the question: Do we have estimates for the relative per ton cost to deliver nature-based solutions, such as large scale deforestation, relative to the technological sequestration approach, such as biochar or direct air capture? Great question. And I'll try and answer this um, at the same time as some of the other questions I saw coming through about cost, um, which are really good questions. Um, so the 11 gigaton number that I quoted, and then in the graph, which I'm very happy to share, the relative size of the different uh, parts of the bar correspond to the relative contribution of different types of natural climate solutions that we saw below. Avoided forest conversion, improved forest management, wetland conservation, things like that. Um, and so we've actually tried to get at a sense of both the relative proportion of each of those natural climate solutions compared to each other and compared to the other two thirds needed to come from decarbonization. The way we did that is to create what we call ambition parity between different interventions. Um, by using the social cost of carbon at around $100 a ton. So basically that 11 gigaton number is already um, normalized at $100 a ton. There are many of these pathways, for example, reforestation that could deliver almost all of that 11, uh, 11 gigatons on their own if we were to reforest all of the quote reforestable places on earth. But that's probably not advisable um, nor um, necessarily cost effective. So we wanted to set a parameter that allowed us to have a more, what we call ambition parity between those different types of interventions. I hope that answers the very good question. It's great to see such great questions coming through. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I, I definitely think that answers the question. And a question actually for you, Luri, how do you ensure that bringing the DAC technology to the market doesn't create incentives that slow the pace of emission reduction. And that's like a repeated pattern that we receive when we talk about carbon removal. Yeah, no, great question. And, and it's, it's kind of that moral hazard discussion that we've had for many years. How do we make sure that we all focus on reducing our emissions first so that we, that that's, the, that's the better way to do it. And, and, uh, and we need to focus on that first and then remove what we can't. And, and uh, I'll, borrow, I'll borrow from Swiss Re here. They say, do our best, remove the rest. So do our best, do what we can to remove, reduce emissions and then remove the rest. And I guess, um, you know, the, the sort of straightforward answer to that is that we, we're already experiencing the impact of climate change. We, we found fossil fuels under the ground hundreds of years ago. They were a fantastic source of abundant, cheap energy, but we took all of that out of the geosphere and we added all of that carbon to the active biosphere and we're already feeling the impact of climate change, we have to start to remove some carbon. And then as the world um, you know, tries to reduce emissions, we also need to be able to remove some of the carbon that's being emitted. We just must do that going forward. Thank you. Uh, another question for you, Liz. When you say remove the equivalent of the historical emissions, are you talking about getting to historical net zero? And also uh, some of the audience are asking if, um, if you're in favor of large carbon tax, like the scale of $100 per ton. It's a great, great set of questions. When we um, established our carbon negative commitment in January, 2020, we looked at um, frankly, what the boldest thing we could possibly think of to do <laughs> to um, make a statement and to, to set a chart a journey um, to be both uh, yeah, climate resilient and um, 
and 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 uh, climate leader. And so we um, we knew from the climate equity movement that developed countries and industrialized countries have succeeded and grown and prospered, frankly, on the backs of um, the developing world and uh, through the fossil fuel economy. And so we said, um, we know from that, um, from that community that it's crucially important to, um, to look at the backlog um, of, of emissions that we've, um, we've made. And so that was the, that was the genesis of the of the commitment to remove our historical emissions, I will say that we didn't um, we didn't go back to uh, the garage or the the office in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where Microsoft was first founded in 1975 to get the energy bills of that um, of that initial uh, operation. We did just do some um, basic basic analysis of our of our estimates of our emissions, and so we um, we are covering. Um, we're covering that, and and whether or not it's historical net zero, I think um, is it is a debate that's worth having. But we just think it's crucially important to address that as a as a sort of a, in the fullness of our commitment. Um, with regard to a carbon tax, we actually have an internal carbon fee, so we have a lot of experience internally since 2012. We've had a lot of experience with um, actually levying an internal carbon fee, and so also um, when we made our carbon negative commitment in January 2020, we expanded that carbon fee to include. Um, all of our scope three emissions. So it now covers all of our scopes one, two, and three emissions. And that's been um, critically important. That's currently at $15 a ton. Um, that's critically important to show, um, uh, to drive accountability and um, to drive, um, frankly, data um, data integrity across, um, across our value chain because um, having that monetary impact has driven data improvement in the sort of notoriously um, gnarly uh, topic of scope three emissions. And so that's actually been tremendously, tremendously helpful as a, as a price signal, um, both for uh, data quality and for actual decarbonization. And whether or not we need to have a hundred dollar a ton carbon fee, I think um, the market will tell. And I think, I think there is a role for an important role for governments to play in that. Um, but I think what should happen is, is really a look at um, something like Columbia University has done with the levelized cost of carbon abatement, where we actually look at um, what's the most cost effective way to decarbonize, whether it's um, energy efficiency, which is the first 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 choice of should be the first choice of any strategy, um, energy efficiency, renewables, sustainable aviation fuel, direct air capture, we should be rationalizing all of those strategies and costs holistically. So. That's that's the long-winded answer from a carbon nerd. Thank you. Now we, we really appreciate carbon nerds here at C2S. So um, let me move back to you, Peter. Um, the issue of the durability of removals when we talk about nature-based solutions has always been a concern. Uh, and for sure we have seen like the recent wildfires in the West and how people have uh, different concern around how permanent these removals can be. So can you talk to this point and let us know what you think? Yeah, it's a great question. So many great questions coming across. Let me answer in sort of two phases. Um, I think our research at the Nature Conservancy tries to assign what we call a saturation point to all natural climate solution interventions or what we call pathways. Um, and it's true that many of them are going to achieve their potential um, after a certain time period. They can't continue going on sequestering um, through reforestation or others, they have different sort of saturation points. So that's definitely one thing to keep in mind. Um, but in terms of the climate feedbacks on those natural climate solutions that render them more vulnerable um, and less powerful, that's absolutely true. There's research to support that. But there's sort of two ways to think about that. Like the, the first is to say, oh, natural climate solutions aren't going to work. They're not going to be permanent. Let's look to technological carbon capture and storage. I think that's the wrong way. I think the other way is no, no, like nature, um, the non-human natural world is trying to lend us a hand here in the predicament we've put ourselves. And it's getting a little bit tired of us not actually taking advantage of their offering. There's a good question in there about how effective have we been at actually scaling natural climate solutions? And the answer is not very, we need all kinds of like, it's really important we don't have an either or mindset because all of the different scenarios Dr. Jory proposed require all of the things that we know about and some of the things we don't. So um, deep investments across everything 
immediately absolutely do are needed. And so a response to the critique about the impermanence of natural climate solutions is we just need to actually work faster to get them going on the ground now before nature gives up on us and isn't able to cope with those longer term changes. And, and then, of course, many natural climate solutions are fairly durable, and we need to know where those are and what those are so we can prioritize them in the right way of phasing our interventions accordingly. Thank you for that. Um, Mahmoud, may, I, may I jump in? May I jump sure. in on that question as well? Um, we feel um, really strongly. I saw a question in the chat about um, why why would we not talk about the problems with integrity of offsets? And I think um, actually, all I think all three of our organizations have um, very been very public about that and been very sort of um, open to. Um, having constructive dialogue around that topic. That's a, I think um, I would point folks to our white paper from January 2021, as well as our criteria um, from July. Um, because uh, as Peter said, we need all of the above solutions, but we also need them to be high quality if we're gonna get where we need to go. So to us, it's um, we're very, very um, committed to being transparent about the foibles and, and sort of pitfalls of, of this journey. Because I think we can't get there unless we are. Thank you. And I want to highlight for our audience that our second panel, we will discuss more actually around offsets. So stay tuned for that. And let me ask you, Lurie. So while uh, durability is not much a concern for direct air capture, if it's associated with permanent storage, cost is actually a concern. So can you tell us how do you expect the cost curve for that to be developed or at least to develop in the future and how much it can affect the scalability of the technology? Yeah, no, absolutely. Great question. Um, so in terms of, you know, uh, the cost curve and where do we need to go with policies to support the scaling of this technological solution? Um, we actually, in the paper we published uh, in 2018, we showed first plant and nth plant, CapEx, OpEx, um, and the audience is welcome to take a look at that if there, if there, if there are a couple of questions about the details there. Um, the interesting thing about um, policies today and, and other solutions is that carbon policies today that we're already working on that we have in place um, are two or three or four times higher than the cost of our even our first project. Um, so the, the challenge for us as a new, new kid on the block, um, a new technological solution is really just to make sure that direct air capture based solutions, whether that's taking the CO2 and permanently putting it back underground or taking the CO2 and converting it to a low carbon fuel made out of air and green hydrogen, making sure that both of those technological solutions are eligible under existing policies. Um, and then we will really be able to accelerate the pace of the build out of the technology, of the technology because markets that already exist will, will be able to recognize these technological solutions. Um, so, so good news is that we're, we're cost effective. We're a fraction of the cost of many of the solutions that we're already working on today. We just need to make sure that policies um, include this as, as viable alternatives. Thank you. Uh, we are getting really close to our time. If I can ask each one to name just one policy intervention that if you would like to have on the table right now to scale TDR, what would you recommend very briefly? We've been vocal in the past about um, a price on carbon, frankly. I mean, a price on carbon is I think the single most powerful tool that we have to level the playing field among these different technologies. And I think it's also crucial to um, drive accountability as we've experienced internally. I see a lot of nodding and agreement. Uh, so uh, on that agreement, uh, I wanna thank you all for your time and joining us today. And now we will uh, move to our next part of the webinar today. Thank you all for the great discussion again. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Charles Coven, uh, who will explain us uh, how the Earth system responds to net zero and net negative CO2 emissions, and what aspects of the climate change are reversible under the net negative emissions. Dr. Coven is an Earth system scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. He investigates feedback between climate and the carbon cycle. He is also a lead author for the IPCC assessment report. Uh, over to you, Dr. Charles. Thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, and thank you to all the other speakers. Um, yeah, so I, I would like to uh, talk uh, about the Earth system response to uh, net negative CO2 emissions. Um, and I uh, don't see my slides. I don't know if other people do or not. But 
there we go. Great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, as Mark Mahmoud said, my name is Charles Coven. I'm a, a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And uh, well, this is uh, great. Yeah. So um, next slide. So yeah. So I want to start with the same um, the same graphic that Yuri started with, um, which is this really surprisingly simple relationship between uh, total climate change, total warming, and total cumulative CO two emissions. Um, this this really you know surprising and shocking simplicity arises out of a lot of uh, interacting, much more complex processes, and it's you know it's. It, it's 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 we're very lucky that we we have this very simple relationship or at least luckily you know if you're trying to explain it um that there is this simple relationship that every ton of co2 emissions adds to warming um and so the question i want to ask and that we um tried to address in the uh, most recent ipcc uh, assessment report um is what you know what does a ton of negative co2 emissions uh do does this same uh, same relationship hold and 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 what are the, some of these dynamics between the interaction between the carbon cycle and the climate system uh, next slide, please. And so we looked at some long term scenarios um, using coupled climate and carbon cycle models um, to, to look at how the, the both the carbon cycle and the climate system would respond under some of these scenarios in which we peak and then reach net zero emissions, or sorry, beyond net zero um, to net negative emissions. Um, and so starting off here in one of these scenarios, um, in, in, you know, into in this sort of current period, this first half of, of the 21st uh, century, where um, we are emitting you know, very large amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere, and about half of what we're emitting into the atmosphere is being taken up by the land and ocean, right? And so land and ocean are providing this massive service to us um, as, as sinks that then counteract our emissions. Uh, next slide. And as in the in these scenarios, as we go forward um, and 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 achieve closer to net zero emissions, um, and we as we uh, reduce our emissions into the atmosphere, the expectation is that the land and ocean sinks would then also start to weaken in their strength in response to that. They basically stop taking up um, some of this ex excess CO two that we've been emitting. Um, next ne next slide. And then as we go beyond this, you know, and beyond this sort of the time frame of the 21st century to reach to these scenarios in which we get um, net negative emissions, basically the, the, the projection from the climate models is that the land and ocean together basically sort of stop, you know, either completely stop taking up our, our emissions and in some cases may actually start to emit uh, carbon back into the atmosphere in response to these negative CO2 emissions. Uh, next slide. And that the, and that these, uh, the, the, this would then continue into the future. So as we then stabilize the climate, we can, you know, we, we can stabilize our emissions and stabilize um, the, 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 the sinks uh, from the land and ocean, but that they would not continue to act as long-term uh, uh, sinks, uh, it, at least not nearly as strong as they are right now. Um, next slide. And so what we what we've done uh, in, in, in for the for this scenario or, or for, for this assessment report is to look at you know different scenarios of in which we either um, have have very large amounts of net negative CO two emissions or small amounts of net negative CO two emissions to explore how the carbon cycle and climate system respond to both these cases if we overshoot our targets and then try and get out of that by um, by a large amount of net negative emissions and what we see from from the climate models is that. Uh, the land is it can more readily switch uh, from a sink to a source than the ocean. Basically, that under uh, both the sort of weak emission, uh, weak negative emissions scenarios like this uh, SSP one two point six, um, the, the the land can become a sink, but the ocean remain. Sorry, the land may become a source, but the ocean will remain a sink. Whereas under this stronger net negative emissions, this overshoot scenario in the purple line, both the uh, the land and the ocean um, may switch from sink to source to the atmosphere. Um, however, there's a delay. Um, a delay of decades between when our, our CO2 emissions reverse from net positive to then net zero and net negative, uh, b b b and then the land and ocean transition from a sink to a source after that. Next slide. Right, so so what, what's going on here? Why why do we expect um, th th these things to, to happen? Is that you know is that is that a bad thing? Right, this idea of uh, carbon sinks becoming sources is kind of a scary scary possibility, right? It, um, you know, currently there's a lot of, uh, of of you know concern in the models project that you know under high emission scenarios we expect increased disturbance, increased rates of decomposition to, to possibly lead um, the land uh, to be to become a, a source of carbon in the atmosphere. So that's not what would happen under net negative CO2 emissions. Basically, the idea under net negative CO2 emissions is that because we re reduce the the, uh, the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere, that would then on land weaken this effect of CO2 fertilization that causes plants to grow faster than they would otherwise, and thereby slow their growth rates 
um, closer to what they have have been historically, um, which would then uh, you know lead lead the, the land to start taking up less carbon. But it would not be this kind of catastrophic outcome like we see you know in California with increased fires or things like that um, th that we have under under high climate uh, high high climate amounts of climate change. In the ocean, again, this this would be driven to you know outgassing of CO two basically by reversing the gradient of CO two concentrations from the land to the uh, between the uh, between the atmosphere and the ocean. The the ocean would then outgas some of the CO two that it's taken up. And this is actually there's some co-benefit to this. And the key, key one is that it would also in turn reduce the, the acidification of the surface ocean. Um, and the net effect of all of this is to maintain as an airborne fraction, basically just as, as positive as a, a constant fraction um, of, our, of our positive CO2 emissions is taken up by the land and ocean, a, a relatively constant fraction of negative emissions would be offset by releases from the land and ocean. Next slide. And so the result of all this is that the roughly the proportionality between warming and cumulative CO2 emissions still holds even under strong CO2 uh, uh, negative CO2 uh, emissions. So just as you know, on, on these kinds of uh, cumulative emissions curve, right now we're moving you know from the bottom left to the upper right corner under positive CO2 emissions. It, as we are able to begin, or if and when we are able to start begin taking carbon out of the atmosphere, we expect that roughly the same uh, dynamic to, to occur, that you will have a roughly proportional uh, amount of warming to cumulative emissions, so that as we reduce and, and decrease those cumulative emissions, we will decrease our, the, the temperature change uh, in roughly the same amount. Next slide. However, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? The models that, that we use to, to do this, um, some of them are more symmetric than others. Some, some have de delays and lags either in the climate cycle, uh, uh, the climate system or the carbon cycle. And we still, a lot of you know, work needs to be done in order to understand exactly how, how symmetric this is. But the, but the main finding is that we expect this to work roughly symmetrically. Uh, next slide. And okay, so the, the, all that is about temperature, right? We expect temperature to be to be relatively reversible, but then other aspects of the climate system are, are less reversible. So you know, on on here, um, and this on the bottom left figures is you know a, a time series of uh, CO of total CO two concentrations that peak and then decline be, as a result of net negative emissions, um, and and on the on the bottom left uh, is is the, this yellow line shows this sort of this lag of, of you know a few years between um, when the, the the we peak our emissions and and the temperatures start to decrease. On the upper right um, is is example of, of permafrost uh, extent, and basically that has lags because it takes time for the for for the um, soil the soil temperatures to respond to the climate change, and so that gives a lag of decades between when we might start to increase permafrost area um, in response to negative CO two emissions. And then lastly on the bottom right aspects of the climate system that have an enormous amount of inertia like sea level rise will not be reversed by 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 um ne negative emissions in fact will continue to to um to occur albeit at a slower rate than they would if we don't reverse emissions um in in, in response to negative emissions so we can reverse some aspects of climate change but other aspects we cannot uh next slide yeah, so so this is just the summary that you know if we can achieve net negative emissions um, at at the global scale, then we expect the land or ocean takes may actually respond um, in, in a way that it, you know they will uh, release some of the CO two that they've been previously requesting and sequestering and acting as sources of CO two to the atmosphere. This switch leads to a an airborne fraction, basically you know just as a fraction of our positive emissions are taken up by the land and ocean, we would expect a fraction of our negative emissions to be offset by the land and ocean. Um, and that this then actually then leads to the same proportionality that we see, or roughly the same proportionality that we see between cumulative emissions and global temperature change under positive emissions to also hold even under negative emissions. However, slower aspects of the climate system, in particular sea level rise, would still continue even under scenarios with net negative CO2. Uh, and with that, I will end. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Charles. That's that's a very informative presentation. Uh, I think you have showed us like how complicated it can be to stabilize the, the, the climate with different uh, aspects, including land, ocean. But another layer of complexity is that people are involved and the human factor that can't be as easily modeled. And I think your presentation gives a great overview of the other factors, which will set the stage for our next discussion that will address the public perception part of CDR. Uh, Thank you. Uh,
Thank you so much. Uh, let me introduce our panelists for our uh, last but not least uh, panel discussion. Dr. Sally Greenberg, she's the principal scientist for energy and minerals at uh, Illinois State Geological Survey. She's the principal investigator for the Midwest Geological Sequestration Consor Consortium. She also brings hands-on experience working on the only largest scale carbon sequestration project in the United States. Uh, Dr. Janet Bees, she's the chief of advisory services at Blue Source. She has great experience working on market-based policy, offsets, and corporate, corporate sustainability. She's also my former boss. Glad to see you here, Janet. Um, and Dr. Rudra Kapila, she's the senior policy advisor for, for carbon management at Third Way. In her capacity, she advocates for policies to put the United States on the fastest, on the fastest and fairest path to net zero emissions by 2050. Also, she's, she's the co-chair uh, for the Climate Change Working Group at Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And let me start with you, Dr. Greenberg. Uh, can you share with us some lessons on the safety and integrity of carbon storage uh, from the Illinois Peace Indicator Project? Thank you, Mahmoud. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm a geochemist by training, but I hold a master's degree in geology and a PhD in, in education. And this combination of the physical and social sciences research really underlies um, much of what I have brought and what I have taken away from the area of carbon uh, capture utilization and storage, um, and more broadly, CDR. So I've been involved in all aspects of, of um, CCUS for more than the last 20 years. And as Mahmoud mentioned, I was the principal investigator, for not the only carbon storage uh, project in the United States, but the Illinois Basin Decatur project, which is a 1 million ton uh, bioenergy CCS project where we captured carbon dioxide from ethanol production at Archer Daniels Midland and stored it more than a mile beneath the surface. And in that process, um, you know, over the last 20 years of working on that, we I've really seen a lot of the pieces, the puzzle pieces that we need for CCUS and CDR come together. The technical aspects, the social aspects, the legal and the regulatory components, policy, now the economic and the business environment. And we've heard a lot of those um, ideas and opinions in this workshop so far today. You can also hear in the way that we talk about carbon storage over the last years, what has changed. And I think a large part of this is related to, to stakeholder engagement, which I will get to in just a minute. But we've moved from the concept of barriers, technical and social barriers, through to what are the obstacles, what are the challenges, and finally, where do we have successes and where can we learn more? Um, and what we have um, after 20 years with respect to carbon storage is a proven technology that's ready for safe deployment and climate models that incorporate the need for that technology in order to meet the goals uh, that we've set for ourselves. So what I'm seeing lately as we move towards commercialization with each piece, but especially with the engagement piece, is that what we require now to move forward, to continue to, um, to use a, a sports metaphor, move the ball down the field, is that we need more nuance and more development. And so, for example, I've been thinking a lot lately about environmental justice and engagement and looking at how, how do we uh, account for the potential for differences across the value chain of CCUS with regard to, um, uh, to potential different differential impacts. Um, based on my project experience in North America, I did wanna offer a few thoughts about how, how engagement can work and, and what, um, what we see, uh, what I see as best practices. I think it's critical to use communication and engagement best practices, and those don't have to be energy related or carbon capture and storage related. Um, it's important to build partnerships and trust, to use trusted sources of information, uh, be open and transparent in how we communicate and what we share, but also in what we uh, listen to. Um, I think it's critical to be prepared to address a diverse set of questions. You, anybody needs to be able to look 360 degrees 
at the technology or the issues that they're talking about because you never quite know when uh, somebody's or who in the in the public, especially somebody's going to ask you a question that doesn't necessarily relate directly to your area of expertise. Um, and then just a couple of, of uh, comments uh, in closing. Public engagement is a two way communication process. It's not one party trying to convince another party that there's an opportunity or a challenge that needs to be overcome. It's not about convincing our opponents. In a, it really is, um, again, in order to progress beyond the current state of play, we need to be able to change the conversation and have a conversation about energy and climate and where CDR fits into that space. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation with my esteemed panelists and to answer some of these great questions that we're seeing. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the great intro. Uh, on the issue of building trust, uh, let me turn it over to you, Janet. One of the arguments against CDR is that these solutions might be used to offset business as usual practices. So can you tell us about the role of carbon offsets and how to move from offsets to removals? Okay, well, well first let me say thank you for inviting me to be part of this. And, um, and C2ES, uh, as, as Mahmoud mentioned, was home for many years and I can just say that I'm happy I'm not organizing this session, but you've done a great job and I'm really happy to be part of it. So, so back to your really hard question. Uh, how do you ensure that, if I'm rephrasing this correctly, how do you ensure that direct air capture, how do you ensure the CDR is done credibly? And, and I think that when you think about offsets and you think about credibility, there are standards out there that um, define what is a high quality offset, real measurable surplus. You've got a third party verification and you've got all of those rules and requirements transparently um, posted on the voluntary carbon registries. I think that's a critical piece, transparency, knowing how the accounting actually happens. Um, and so making sure that you're following those credible practices. So for example, today, there is not a methodology that's available on one of those registries for direct air capture, but there will be, They're, they are in development. And once those are there, then you can say, okay, you have to do X, Y, and Z, and then you have to have um, a third party come in and verify that, you do ex that you've done exactly what the methodology has said you would do. And, and that's what an offset is. It's an emission reduction that's equally credible as an on-site emission reduction that you do, um, you know, in within your own shop, and there's, I think, you know, we've talked about removals. We've talked about, um, you know, Peter Ellis talked about the importance of avoiding and reducing, and and as well as removing. And I think that at this point in time, you know, you've heard from the different scientists on this panel about how critical. We are, we're at a critical juncture and we really need to deploy all of our tools and resources towards this. And, and looking at just the, the scale, the challenge in front of us, I, I can't see why anybody would say, let's just do one thing or another because we need to do all of it. And the nice thing about offsets, it, offsets is it provides that incentive, that extra monetary incentive and Lori talked a little bit about this with the low carbon fuel standard. And if you think about the value that the low carbon fuel standard can bring, well, that can really incentivize a lot of different action, but you have to do exactly what the low carbon fuel standard means, which is bringing fuel into California. In the voluntary carbon market, that it's a little broader. The value isn't as great as the low carbon fuel standard, but, but the opportunities are greater as long as you're following the rules and requirements of these standards. I'm not sure if I answered your question directly, but I, I'm, um, if there's something I've missed, let me know. No, I, 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 I think you did. You did an excellent job answering my question. Um, I, I just want to turn it over to Dr. Capilla. These different concerns we heard, whether it's like the credibility of, of the removal or the lack of building trust with, with the local communities. And we heard earlier from Les the issue around like how the current state we are in was developed by certain countries or that benefited from uh, certain fuel resources. And now 
we have all to pay for that. So can you tell us a little bit about the main environmental justice concerns when it comes to CDR, whether from a local perspective or from an international perspective? Certainly, and uh, many thanks, Mahmoud, for inviting me here and delighted to join uh, this esteemed panel. Um, I'll start with perhaps taking your question into two parts. So looking at the local uh, perspective as well as the international perspective when it comes to environmental justice um, surrounding you know, large technological systems and direct air capture certainly falls in that category. Um, uh, I should start by also saying that, so I, like my panel here, I'm an interdisciplinary scientist. My background is in geosciences, um, particularly in CCUS research, but um, I've also done work uh, with environmental justice uh, communities as a community organizer myself here in the US. So um, I'll start with actually the local perspective, uh, which I think is very important to consider when we're looking at deploying um, DAC systems or DAC machines. Um, I think communities, whether locally in the US or even internationally, they're certain kind of universal underpinning concerns across the board. And that is essentially the impact on air quality, uh, both indirectly and directly, um, as well as land use, energy needs, water quality, uh, the ecological integrity, um, as well as, of course, the impacts uh, to human health and safety. And from a local standpoint here in the US, uh, there has been a long legacy of where, and I should differentiate here, fence line communities. Those are communities predominantly um, of color, black and brown communities that live closer or in very close proximity to industrial facilities um, or fossil fuel facilities. So, there has been a sense of mistrust between those communities and project developers. And previously, um, or I should say in the past, uh, quite often these communities, the first time they even have any engagement with project developers is at the litigation stage. And I think DAC can really start with a clean slate here and I think a key priority is engaging with communities, making them front and center in any projects that are developed going forward. And communities should not be knowing about the existence of a project um, towards the end at the litigation stages, for example, but rather be central to any deployment structure. Um, it's also very, crucial uh, that for environmental groups and EJ groups that are looking and considering DAC, um, they're currently split in two ways. Um, there's a cohort that are incredibly supportive because naturally, you know, DAC machines can be paired with and share infrastructure with other industrial facilities and can really help cut down the residual emissions. So I think initially some of the first DAC projects we would see would be co-located and share infrastructure with other types of point source CCS projects, whether that's you know, with steel, cement or natural gas and, and other industrial facilities. So the co-location of DAC, for example, with industrial or power CCS is really advantageous in terms of sharing physical infrastructure, but also the industrial workforce. And I think there are environmental um, groups out there that support DAC for this reason, because it allows the use of transferring, you know, an available skilled workforce and creating another form of green jobs. When we think of green jobs, we're 
iconically thinking of solar panels, but this is just another form of a green job. So that really appeals to community groups and um, especially those that have been reliant on high paying, um, good quality jobs associated traditionally with the fossil fuel industry. But there's also another group within the EJ environmental group community that oppose direct air capture because they're considered as you know false solutions or a way of greenwashing because they can be seen as extending the life of polluting industries that have been polluting and impacting the air quality and water quality in that local area and the community that lives there for some time already. So, um, you know, and in the US, there's, you know, a long legacy of race really determining whether someone lives near a polluting facility or, or not. And these are, these have often been, you know, deliberate outcomes of local, state or federal led policies. So there's this real kind of fine balance or balancing act, I should say, that you would need when it comes to deploying these technologies. And that local community issue is both here in, you know, in the US, but also when we talk about internationally, um, when we're looking at technology transfer, perhaps of DAC projects in the future, then local conditions and local community needs would really have to be central to any uh, project development. Because again, um, if you look at the international development literature, there is a longstanding legacy, um, you know, where historically large complex technologies such as coal powered plants have been transferred to the global south from the global north without much consideration of you know, local environmental and social conditions. Um, and that could be with coal and also hydro projects uh, via the World Bank. So, you know, there has to be a real understanding of some of the historical imbalances uh, when it comes to deploying these technologies. Thank you so much. That's a clear and detailed answer to, to my question. Um, I think the issue of the historical legacy takes me back to Dr. Sally. Like as project developers think about these kind of projects, what factors they should consider that can affect public perception of carbon storage, not to repeat the same historical mistakes that has been implemented before? Um, so uh, I, there, there's a lot that be can, can be considered. And I think when you look at um, the stakeholder engagement work that's been done for the last um, two decades in uh, the carbon capture storage area, there's a lot that speaks directly to this. And there's a concept that uh, a colleague and I, Sarah Wade, put forward um, in terms of social site characterization, which is really looking at um, not profiling, but looking to understand uh, site demographics, social concepts, uh, what are the historical um, uh, potential problems or issues in an area, uh, just like um, Dr. Coppola was just literally just talking about, um, and understanding the context of a community in which you are um, hoping to engage and to starting engagement at the very, very beginning. And that is the having your engagement um, uh, team as part of your technical project development team working uh, the WRI work that was done uh, in terms of, of setting up a set of community guidelines that are engagement guidelines that connects project developers with regulators with uh, uh, local leadership. And I would say that expands out in multiple circles as you um, establish engagement. So there are a lot of ways in which you really 
from the beginning can incorporate engagement rather than getting to the unfortunate position of having that first interaction being at a formal permitting hearing or something that indicates that a project is two to five years down the road when the community is just hearing about it for the first time. So we have always uh, believed, um, those of us who have done work through the regional carbon sequestration partnerships, which were funded by the Department of Energy uh, and others globally, that you have to be doing so much more engagement long before you ever get to the permitting stage. So start early, you know, do a lot. I think now, like I said, we have to really find ways to change the conversation and consider uh, communities that have been um, uh, disadvantaged or who have these really extenuating uh, relationships with the fossil fuel industry. So there's a, there's a lot, um, and and but some of it is really just good practice and and common sense about how to treat people and 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 you know uh, nobody likes surprises has kind of become my motto recently. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you, Janet. Uh, also, on, on people, when they hear about offsets, sometimes they are concerned that offsets will be used, whether it's removal or like whether it's nature-based solutions used for offsets or other types of, uh, of technologies. They are concerned that this might be a solution to pollute or like a, a, a license to pollute. How, how, how can we address that concern? How we make sure that's no, that's, that's not the objective of it. I think um, I've heard that argument over the years. And, and it takes me back to a CDP study that I think, um, actually I think Ecosystem Marketplace actually did the study based on CDP data. And in that report, I think it's 2017 and I can send, uh, send a link around for it, I'd have to find it. But um, they actually say that, that companies that invest in offsets actually do more in-house mitigation than companies that don't invest in offsets. And, and if you think about that, the reason is because a company that's buying an offset is sending money out the door. They're not investing in their company, they're sending money out the door. So that's actually a cost. And, and Liz Wilmot talked about internal carbon pricing. Well, buying offsets is, is actually placing a cost on yourself. So companies that pay those prices, and I'm just gonna tell you that offsets are not free, there, if you looked at the market lately, um, there's a lot of concern that there's going to be a shortage and that prices are going way up. Ecosystem Marketplace just put a report out um, a couple of days ago that said that in 2020, the market grew by 80% over 2019. And 2021, we were already 28% above the market in 2020. And that's all during COVID. So there's a lot of investment going on in this market, which is pretty darn exciting. Because if you're, if you've read about the the task force on scaling voluntary carbon markets, you'll know that that Mark Carney, who chaired that effort, said that voluntary markets have to scale by a hundredfold by 2050, and and by some, like I guess I was like 15 times by by 2030. So that's a lot. Um. So how do you Make sure it's not just business as usual well, because it's real money that people are paying on these things and they, certainly i think to be credible you need to be starting at the hierarchy which means reduce at home reduce emissions within your scope one and two first then look at what you can do with your electricity and then go to recs and offsets i mean there's a hierarchy of where you start and and you don't start with offsets you start with reducing emissions at home because there's a lot of benefits, but but offsets have a cost. Thank you, Th thank you for this answer. Um, I would like to go back to Dr. Capilla and ask her about how can we build safeguards for frontline communities, people that are concerned and you have legitimate concerns around around uh, CDR in general. How do we build safe safeguards for these communities? Well. Um... Dr. Greenberg mentioned some of these excellent best practices, which were um, uh, 
kind of eked out by the WRI work on community engagement, which have been really useful in terms of bringing communities in in the earlier stages of project development. But I think a key part for deploying DAC um, in a lot of these communities is really about education. And, and when I say education, there are still some substantial knowledge gaps within DAC deployment in itself. And I probably like to take this opportunity to say that given that there's such few projects that exist, um, there's really kind of little public information available on air quality um, that really kind of makes it difficult to inform, educate and empower communities, whether they actually want DAC systems nearby or what do they actually do, you know, um, and it's the same both locally and internationally. Communities want to know what does DAC do for them? How does it improve their air quality? How does it improve their quality of life? Um, it's not just about removing CO2 emissions. And similarly, given that, you know, we've got the UN General Assembly going on um, this week, and there's a lot of discussion about, you know, looking at DAC from global north, but what does this mean in the global south? It's the same questions. How does DAC contribute to sustainable development? Developing countries or emerging economies have a lot of, um, you know, sustainable development goals that they need to meet. And if there is a way of tying that with DAC deployment, then that would be really key. And so I think educating communities on what these projects are about, how they can benefit them, but I think also a lot of work needs to do in filling these key knowledge gaps with, with DAC, which is about air quality. Um, you know, a lot of these systems are often designed um, in, and, and given that they, you know, they're developed within, you know, the innovation systems of the global north, not necessarily the innovation systems of the global south. So these kind of questions of not just looking at energy needs and efficiency of building a DAC system, but also how does this impact the environment and the local community and what it brings to them, not just about CO2 removal. These are some of the th dialogues and questions and answers that would be needed when you're educating and engaging with communities. I hope that Thank you. the question. Thank you, Dr. Kapila. <laughs> I think it does. Uh, I think we are getting close to uh, the clock here, but let me, before we, we conclude, if I can ask also each of you to give one recommendation that you think is absolutely necessary for carbon removal to be deployed in a safe and a fair way to all communities, what the recommendation will be? Uh, I'll start. <clears throat> so um, I think uh, my recommendation is that we find ways to have hard conversations and that we change the conversation going forward so that we are operating from a system that is fair and equitable for, for all parties uh, involved and that we take into consideration um, the things and the, and the conversations that make us uncomfortable and, and, but allow us to, to be uh, good global stewards. I'll go. Um, in terms of policy, I, I think somebody mentioned earlier in the, the session about carbon pricing. I'm, I've always been a large supporter of you know, capping emissions and then allowing people to figure out the least cost way of actually meeting those emission obligations. I don't really see that in the future, but increased transparency about what companies and entities are actually doing as they get to net zero. I think in increased transparency would help all of us. Um, there isn't um, a, a platform today where everybody can report their inventory and their how they're actually achieving 
their goals. I mean, the, the climate registry is developing a net zero portal and I put a plug in for that. It's not, um, it's not ready for prime time yet, but I think something like that, that actually allows people to, to showcase what they've done, how they've done it in a real transparent way would be useful. And lastly, I, um, the policy I would say, it comes to the crux that who influences and who shapes DAC policy and projects and how they do it is really critically important to a lot of EJ groups. So I would say that showing a real diversity and inclusion um, across the board in the workforce, uh, when we're bringing in academic teams working on projects, let's use the local knowledge. Community colleges should be involved. The, work for, the workforce should really also reflect what the community looks like. And, um, and I think in addition to, of course, the education aspect, but I think that element would pair very nicely with all of the suggestions made by my esteemed panelists. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank all our speakers and our panelists today for the great presentation. And I just wanna say that as we talk about the carbon removal sector, we have a great opportunity, a sector that's being developed right now. So we have a great opportunity to make sure that it's developed from the first moment in a fair way to all communities. So I would uh, advise all of you to engage in, in, in these type of conversations and that's the moment for it. Uh, I want thank you. I want, I want also to thank our audience for staying with us and their engagement and great questions they raised. We tried our best to answer these questions. As I mentioned at the beginning, the recording of this webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel within 24 hours. So stay tuned for that. And you can also find more information on our work and the upcoming webinars at c2es.org. Thanks again and hope you enjoy the rest of your day.